be great pleasure to introduce uh, Gary Comstock, uh, who uh, joins us from uh, the uh, from North Carolina State University, um, where he is a distinguished professor. Um, so uh, he will be speaking on uh, discover deduction, critical thinking meets civil discourse. We're particularly grateful to Gary because he's a, a, a late minute, uh, well, late, reasonably late substitution for Aidan Castigian. Uh, if you're particularly keen to hear her, she had a conflict of, uh, of, 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 of booking, but if you're uh, interested to hear her, she will actually be speaking next week in the ILACT uh, online um, the seminar, so, uh, so that opportunity has not been lost. Anyway, uh, thank you, Gary, and over to you. Thank you, Andrew and Kat, for uh, the invitation. I'm going to talk about um, critical thinking and civil discourse and the uh, abstract I suggested um, says I'll talk about some problems that I've noticed in my students and ways that uh, I am trying to work to address them with a rather large team of people. So I want to divide this into three sections. First, I want to introduce those people very briefly. Aidan Castigian, who Andrew just mentioned, is uh, uh, features prominently in that group. Then I want to talk about these four problems and the solution that I will call Discover Deduction. So I've been working with honors program students here at NC State for several years. I want to especially recognize Sophie Krennic and Emma Herman, who've done a lot of work here. There is Sophie looking gorgeous. She's now a first year med school student at UNC Chapel Hill. And uh, her work with this project has gotten noticed but there are a lot of other, other honor students that have contributed uh, in various ways. There they are. I'm working with a bunch of faculty. I think I saw Jean Goodwin in this meeting, actually. I think she's been in these meetings before. Um, we also have a technology backend crew that's working to develop some AI enhancements of uh, our course. And uh, I will say something about our assessing of our efforts at the very end of this talk. So that's very briefly who we are. I wanted to put the faces and the names up there so you can go back and look at them if you have the opportunity. I've done most of my work in my career on issues in applied ethics. I started uh, thinking about agricultural ethics. That got me thinking about the role of animals on farms, which got me into uh, issues about animal cognition and uh, animal rights. So I've recently worked with a group of people on chimpanzee rights. And I also teach a course on research ethics. Um, but I uh, I know it's hard to believe this the way I look, but I'm actually approaching retirement. And as I do so, I have been thinking about what I could do with my uh, remaining years before I uh, expire. And I was uh, surprised a couple of years ago to learn how poor a job universities are doing in teaching what I think of as the basic skill for a college graduate of critical thinking. This Van Dam and Zahner study by the OECD last year says that 49% of college graduates are in the two lowest categories of critical thinking, emerging and developing. Uh, can you see my cursor on screen? Yes. Um, yes, yeah, so proficiency is here in the middle. Half of college graduates fall into one of these two categories, and yet uh, critical thinking is the skill hiring managers value most. So I see this as an opportunity for those of us that are interested in teaching critical thinking, and philosophers in particular, I see it as an opportunity for us to get out of our departments and, uh, and help other colleges on campus uh, address this, this problem. Uh, many of my students are also uncharitable. They assume the worst about their opponents' arguments. They attribute faulty reasoning to their opponents when their opponents aren't making mistakes. Uh, they often presume their opponents' opinions are only based on emotion and they engage in ad hominems. Thirdly, uh, we are increasingly polarized. This won't come as news to anyone. Uh, I see a lot of undemocratic thinking in my students. Students that uh, I think of as sort of being on my right are suspicious of woke theories. Students I think of as on my left are suspicious of people who think in conspiracy theories. 
There's rage, incivility, latent, and real violence. And many people do not think the universities are helping. And then I've noticed more recently solitary thinking. My students are lonely. They don't feel welcome in the academic community. There's high levels of anxiety, as you probably know, high incidence of depression, and troubling rates of suicidal ideation. There were seven suicides at NC State last year. Um, this does not make fertile ground for students to engage in critical thinking. Many of them can't identify the main claim of texts we read. They can't identify hidden premises that support the main claim. Uh, they're not inclined to interpret texts arguing for views opposed to theirs charitably. And they don't feel confident in their own judgments. They uh, are not really willing to take risks. So the challenge here is not to teach students how to think about reasoning, but to teach them how to reason. And I don't need to tell this group this, but the truth is that we know very little about reasoning and how to teach it. And just how much we can improve reasoning by instruction is now a completely open question. Now that's what Lehman Lundberg and Nisbet uh, said in the American Psychologist in June of 1988. Uh, but we actually have made some progress since then, I think, on all those issues. And uh, we can ask whether critical thinking courses help. And the answer is yes, especially if they use argument mapping. Uh, I don't know who's in the crowd, but some, uh, some of the studies mentioned here, uh, the authors may be. Um, I just brought, bring your attention to uh, the middle one. Cohen found that students using argument mapping showed substantial improvement on the LSAT logical reasoning test. Um, Cohen's uh, initiative featured uh, small groups. I think it was 12 or 15 students in seminar settings over I think the course of most of a semester. So uh, intensive argument mapping uh, helped a lot. Um, what I discovered a couple of years ago was thinker analytics work in how we argue. And they have an online course that costs $25 per student. I think maybe it's $35 now. Instructors can get a free account and work through each of these six lessons, there are actually 10 lessons, I just included the first six here, that uh, use mastery learning to teach students the components of arguments, how to identify inferences, and how to provide uh, co-premises. So I'm uh, now a collaborator with uh, Aiden Castigian and Ann Sanderson and others on their team, and I would encourage those of you that don't know about that uh, that instrument to take a look at it. It's being used on a number of different campuses, uh, including my own. And the idea is here is that uh, when we try to help students learn how to talk in a civil way about a controversial issue like abortion, argument mapping can help them do that just by giving them a visual representation of what the main claim is, abortion is more wrong, and how that claim is supported. Does it help for philosophers to provide the actual critical thinking instruction? The answer is yes. On the right here are critical thinking courses taught outside the philosophy department. And the uh, Ortiz suggests that uh, all uh, among those students in critical thinking classes, they're seeing uh, gains of about 0.3 standard deviations. This, These are philosophy courses that explicitly teach critical thinking, uh, whether they have argument mapping in them or not. And you can see here, uh, results are almost twice as good. Um, these are in the middle of number seven are uh, students that have no philosophy and no critical thinking courses. Um, so just uh, uh, a university education absent these uh, kinds of classes will give you some, some improvement all on its own, but taking a critical thinking class from a philosopher, especially if they're using argument mapping, can make dramatic uh, gains. And the reason why is because uh, those instructors are skilled in logic and argument analysis. But even our philosophy majors struggle. This is a quote from uh, an associate head of a philosophy department, a large East Coast STEM-oriented university who had read eight years of every philosophy major's capstone 
paper, including three samples that span philosophy, history, philosophy, m and &E, and ethics. All these students had seen many examples of deductive argument reconstruction. All had taken at least one course that focuses on deductive logic. All had been given guidelines illustrated by examples of how to do the relevant kind of argument reconstruction. All of them were reminded to use the techniques from their logic courses and all had to submit at least two drafts of each paper so instructors could comment and help them. Yet only a small minority of philosophy majors seemed able to use the techniques from their logic courses or to emulate the models provided by their instructors in classes. So this is a hard task that we're uh, trying to tackle. And uh, what I've done is develop a course that builds on the how we argue course. I call it how we evaluate. It uses mastery learning, which involves practice, practice, practice. It involves community building, small groups that uh, work together and face-to-face -face instruction and argument mapping and discovery deduction. So I give them a text like Tom Reagan's argument that we should all be vegetarians. I ask them whether they think the argument is sound. I tell them that to decide that question, I want them to map the argument as a valid deductive argument. So this is a what I call the 10 box model. The main claim is in the box at the top. There are two lines of reasoning suggesting that in any essay that they're going to read, there are probably more than one line of support for the argument. There could be more. And then there will be uh, objections in boxes six and seven to some of the premises that are then rebutted by the author or that uh, we might be able to rebut on the author's behalf. And then um, once they fill in these boxes with one sentence each, they're asked in box 10 to evaluate the soundness of the argument. So how do they get from the text to uh, an argument map like that? And it's a, a difficult task. Um, the how we evaluate course um, walks them through that and helps them sort of figure out what the keywords are to identifying uh, main claims, where there's argument being offered, where there's description or other kinds of distractors going on, how to find rebuttals and objections in the text with the idea to develop five cognitive skills, identify contentions, discover deductive arguments for that contention, record objections, provide rebuttals, and assess soundness. So that's what I mean by critical thinking. They, the course, which is freely available to anyone, uh, uses six argumentative essays as target practice. Uh, the abortion issue, uh, Thompson argues in favor of abortion, and Don Marquis argues abortion is immoral, and they also do animal rights with Tom Reagan and Carl Cohen's. These are sort of classic pieces in applied ethics. And then there are two essays on uh, physician-assisted suicide. So the method seeks to help students learn to see the actual structure of these essays, identify missing premises, supply valid deductive arguments for their opponents' claims, and work with and assume a charitable attitude toward their interlocutors. Now, why look for deduction uh, rather than uh, induction because it looks like most arguments are inductive in the wild. And most authors seem to argue inferentially using a loose probabilistic strategy. Uh, the idea here is that deduction is present in the ar these arguments, it's just hiding. And by discovering it, uh, which is hard and productive work, uh, it, students can uh, learn to work with opponents. This is a skill that can be taught. It can bring them together in common task and actually be a first step toward establishing some measure of trust between uh, inter the interlocutors. So think about this uh, example. Deduction is present, or this claim, deduction is present, just hiding. Here's an example. Republicans are enemies of the state. They tried to overthrow an election. Now, when I put this example on the board, I'm quick to sort of point out that uh, I'm not after Republicans here. You could easily uh, make the same argument using Democrats or enemies of the state. They try to overthrow an election. You'll find lots of Americans that both believe uh, either one of those claims. Those look like inductive arguments. Now, why not teach students to map them as such? And the reason is that they, is that they actually harbor deductive arguments and 
revealing the deductive arguments will assist us in bringing the opponents together by giving them a common task with the right answer and put the missing premises on the table so that the inquiry can proceed clearly and in an orderly way. So here's how the argument actually goes that Republicans are enemies of the state. It's F's are G's, but a quantifier is missing there. So the claim becomes all F's are G's, all Republicans are enemies of the state is the actual argument that's being made. But that premise is recognizably false. And since it is recognizably false, it gets in the way here, as I'll try to show. Uh, a plausible restriction is difficult so the claim becomes all Fs that are Hs are Gs. And in the end, the argument gets restated this way. Almost all Fs, those Fs that I care about or that tend to show up in news stories or protest marches are Gs. My thanks to David Austin for this uh, uh, example. And this last form is what suggests that inductive reasoning is intended here. And mirroring induction, which is, I think, the way many of my colleagues go about this, teaches students to start with the premise, almost all Fs are Gs, but starting there fails to get this premise onto the table, that all Fs are Gs. And it's that premise that begs for evaluation. So deduction is present, but hard to find. Here's another example. Gun-owning people are good people. We're all convinced that S is true and we're just about always correct. So it's practically certain that S is true and we don't need to argue for S. And you're probably not a good person if you doubt S. Now, uh, you might also run the same example with uh, different uh, uh, suppliers here. University researchers are intelligent people. We're convinced that S is true and we're just about always correct. So it's practically certain that S is true and we don't need to argue for S. And you're probably not an intelligent person if you doubt S. Mirroring induction teaches students to think first about the chances that some claim or other is true, those claims in red. But asking about the truth of the claims first deflects attention from the argument structure. And discovered deduction teaches students to think first about what structure would be required to make the argument valid? So there's P, Q, and R, therefore S. We can reconstruct the argument that way and then point out that not only does S not follow from P, Q, and R, uh, but all of P, Q, and R are false as well. So that's uh, sort of the idea here. Begin with attacks like Thompson's defense of abortion, and help students uh, discover uh, a deductive argument like this one on the left. I uh, want to point out to my students right away that Judith Jarvis Thompson is a very well-respected philosopher, a number of books um, that were influential. And the, one of the reasons that her argument, her article is uh, so widely read is because most arguments that defend abortion as she does take issue with 2.2, that abortion kills a fetus and innocent person. But she actually grants the truth of that claim for the purposes of her argument and looks at 2.1. So there's the structure of her argument. And when I'm starting with students, I go through this little exercise. So I invite you just for the next two minutes, to put yourself in the student's seat and look at this argument with, with, with me. I asked them, is this a valid argument? And immediately the temperature in the room goes up. And the reason is because they're thinking about the truth of 2.1 and 2.2. Uh, they haven't yet learned what a valid argument is. And even if they have learned it, they uh, uh, haven't uh, learned to treat it as a technical question. Um, so I tell them yet that yes, that is, a valid argument, and then the temperature in the room goes up even higher. But I point out that uh, what we mean by a valid argument is that we've gotten the structure right. If all the premises are true, the conclusion can't be false. So then I immediately give them this problem. Look at this argument. And now thinking about the structure, figure out what claim goes in 2.2. 
They look at it and the room gets really quiet and the temperature in the room goes down. And I ask them to work with their neighbor and sometimes they're working with neighbors who have different opinions about the moral justifiability of abortion. Figure out what goes in 2.2 and remember their right and wrong answers. My students are not really very good at this, which is a little disturbing because I just gave them the right answer. We had been talking about 2.2 prior to my giving them the assignment of filling 2.2 in. So I give you that example of what I do in my classroom just as uh, a reminder that even filling in enthymemes and finding missing premises is a difficult skill for many introductory first year students and apparently for many college graduates as well. So discover deduction helps us meet our goals, teaching students to think critically, helps them to learn to look past the examples, digressions, illustrations, the rhetoric, expansions, and sides in a text or speaker to find the main claim. It creates a safe place for cooperation and charitable thinking, empowering students to work together, requiring individuals different opinions to overcome their suspicions of each other, helping students recognize that they typically don't disagree about the inferential strength that premises provide to contentions. They typically disagree on the truth of the premises. Students are not allowed to discuss the premises truth values until they finish making a deductively valid argument for a contention. And this I find creates some measure of community and trust where there was suspicion and division. And to some extent, this also helps fight loneliness by creating an academic community. Students collaborate to figure out how to fill in all of the 10 boxes in the 10 box model. Collaboration builds trust, but critical thinking has to come first and charitable thinking second. And this I think is an important point because uh, throughout most of my career, I wanted to teach students to be nice to each other and to think charitably. And they just didn't take the bait when I would tell them to be nice. But if I tell them to work together, uh, charity sort of comes for free afterwards and uh, civil discourse is more likely to ensue. So engaging in charitable behavior in face-to-face -face classroom cultivates the habits of mind needed to interpret authors of text charitably and communicate respectfully. How do we know this? Uh, this is my second to last slide. Um, I just want to mention that we're engaged in an experiment to try to test this uh, in a quasi-randomized controlled trial. We are taking all of our first year honors program students. Um, that's 500 this year and 500 next year over the course of the next two years. Half of them will complete how we argue and the other half won't. They'll just do the regular honors program curriculum. Both groups will complete pre and post tests, the pre, uh, including the LSAT logical reasoning test, which is the test that Simon Cohen used and the experiment I referenced earlier, and then a new CT critical thinking test that we've developed. And we hope the results will show the extent to which how we argue can affect critical thinking skills when taught in a large classroom setting, because we will have 250 of the entering 500 students in how we argue in a big classroom lecture setting. So we've actually just completed the, the first group of students and uh, we will give them a post-test in December and have some data at that point. We would invite you to join us uh, because we would like to expand this study beyond our campus, uh, assuming that it looks like uh, we're learning something from it. <clears throat>